on big data with SharePoint or integrating big data with SharePoint. Uh, it's uh, 2 o'clock Eastern time zone. I promise, Dr. I'm only going to be taking up 45 minutes of your time. But if you do have any questions, I'll be more than happy to address those questions for you. And I am uh, providing you my contact information, um, email, you can follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, feel free. Um, I don't blog a lot about uh, technology nowadays primarily because I've been focusing on uh, presentations and I do a lot of consulting work. So this session was born out of uh, me getting involved in the big data community and having talked to a lot of customers who are now getting into big data and working with SharePoint as well uh, for the past couple of uh, years. Um, last year I've started to focus more on BI as something to provide SharePoint users. So let me start by making a statement and I always tell people this that I may get into trouble by saying a lot of things but I, I believe the big data is hype. Uh, marketing professionals and a lot of announcements from different vendors have made big data such a hype and that now people are getting confused in, in uh, community and technical community in general especially the database professionals are now getting confused as to what big data really is and why is it there. But on top of that, if you look at history, you look at how things have become throughout the years. I've started working with databases in the earlier versions of Oracle 7, I think, or 8, and SQL Server 6.5. And you've seen how data has grown throughout the years. I mean, think about this. Back in the days, a 4 gigabyte database is considered to be a, a very large database. Nowadays, you could fit a 4 gigabyte file inside your iPhone or even on your tablet. So we cannot get out of or we cannot ignore the fact that big data is more than just a hype. I mean, we're collecting more data than we need, but it, there's really no sense for us to continue collecting data without maximizing its usage and making the most out of it. As database professionals, even though big data, I, and again, even though I consider big data as a hype, as database professionals, it's something that we cannot ignore. There will always be a reason for technology to continuously collect and hoard, if you want to call it that, data. You can collect information, but really, why do we want to use big data? And to be perfectly honest, a lot of companies that I've, I've uh, uh, talked to with regards to their use cases of big data do not use the typical use cases that we've seen in a lot of the use cases provided for big data, like social media. Companies are still wrapping their head around how they can maximize um, social media more so taking advantage of collecting social media information and data and storing it in big data platforms. But like I said, as database professionals, this is something that we cannot ignore. And as I mentioned, this presentation was born out of understanding how the big data community um, uh, has evolved and understanding how data in general has evolved. Now, if we look back to the uh, traditional data warehouse and the traditional data warehouse projects, a typical data warehouse project does not come out quickly. And what I, what I mean by that is when your business analysts start asking questions about can we do an analysis on this, the first thing you ask is, well, do we have the data for that? Well, we don't have one yet. So the process of creating a data warehouse, designing the data warehouse, the ETL process between your existing data sources and pushing that data towards your, your data warehouse is something that takes a lot of effort and time. I mean, come to think of it, if you ask your business analysts about something that they want analyzed and they want business insights on top of, between now and three to six months down the road, you're probably still working on your data warehouse and how to get that populated. Well, guess what? 
three to six months down the road, the landscape has changed. Business has constantly changed. And nowadays, technology and business have changed a lot quickly. Now, what might be irrelevant data, relevant information three months ago is no longer relevant. So we need to constantly be evolving as well with regards to how we collect data. But the traditional data warehouse doesn't really cut the chase though. And this is where the modern data warehouse comes into the picture. And Microsoft painted a very good picture of how the modern data warehouse comes in. Gone are the days when all we care about are tra or traditional rel relational data sources, where you got your typical relational database schema just to collect information from your data but now we're collecting information from non-relational data sources, like pictures, for example. Metadata from pictures that you could use for your analysis. Or video files that maybe you're, you're uh, analyzing. Uh, one customer of mine used scanned images because they're doing document management and they want to capture the metadata for that information. You can't just store very large objects or blobs, binary large objects in relational databases as efficiently and as performant as you want it to because they're not designed for that. And that's where the non-relational uh, data source or data storage come into the picture. This is where your big data platforms can be useful to store data real quick without even thinking of how are we going to structure this, the idea behind using big data uh, sources and storage platforms is to store data now and structure it down the road, which means you, you now have the data and then if the business analysts want to analyze it down the road, well, at least you already have the data, it's just a matter of defining structures on top of it. Now, um, I'm not, I'm not going to be talking about the different um, big data platforms, primarily from a marketing or sales perspective, because I'm not a marketing guy. But really what I wanted to focus on within the next two slides uh, is plainly just to give you some options. On-premise solution, you got Hortonworks, which is the Hortonworks data platform, where if you have Windows engineers, because Hadoop and big data in general was designed with the Linux operating system in mind. But then what if you don't have Linux engineers, well, thankfully you got Hortonworks data platform that runs on top of both Windows and Linux. In fact, they're the only distribution that runs on top of Windows. And then there's Cloudera. And the reason I mention Cloudera is because it has become the de facto Hadoop platform in the enterprise. It's becoming more like the red hat of Linux, where it's gaining a lot of uh, uh, foothold in the enterprises, primarily because it was the first uh, uh, distribution to come out. And so a lot of documentation, a lot of best practices have been tailor-fitted towards Cloudera. But this is the on-premise platform. Um, companies like financial institutions sometimes can't wrap their, their head around moving data to the cloud, and that's why they opted for an on-premise platform. But of course, you also have cloud providers like Windows, Azure, uh, HD Insight Service, which runs the Hortonworks data platform um, on the back end. But then you could provision cloud-based big data platforms quick and fast. You don't have to worry about uh, paying for what you're using. And again, the reason I, I mention this is because this gives you the opportunity to either test the waters not have to worry about large infrastructure and use big data platforms like Hadoop platforms like Cloudera and Hortonworks to start integrating and making use of big data within your organization. And so um, part, of the, uh, part of the presentation is using self-service BI with Excel. Um, if you haven't seen Excel 2013, I strongly suggest that you do so. Because now with Power Pivot, which used to be an add-in to Excel, is now a native, um, uh, a native feature in Excel, and together with Power View. So these two will be used in my demonstration. Now, before I move further, why don't I switch to um, my demo environment? 
So in my demo environment, I have a Cloudera um, Hadoop distribution running on my, my environment. And I, just to give context on my, on my demo for, for this session, web logs is one typical use case, or web server logs is one typical use case for using big data, analyzing server logs so that IT professionals can take advantage of the insights that they can find by uh, looking at server logs. But really, business analysts don't really care about that. They don't. But the one thing that I want to point out is to really take, make the most out of an, a technology investment like big data, you want to do something that will benefit the organization and that the business analysts can take advantage of. So in this case, here's what I'll do. As an IT professional, so I'll be wearing multiple hats throughout the demonstration, I will be wearing the hat of the IT professional, which is responsible for collecting web server logs and pushing that over to my big data environment. And my big data environment here, again, is a Cloudera Hadoop uh, distribution. I have WinSCP, which is a tool that I use to upload those server logs in my Hadoop platform. I have only have like a single node Hadoop cluster running in my uh, test environment. So I've already uploaded those uh, server logs. And just to show you an idea of what those server logs look like, so I've got server logs with date, time, IP address, the URL, and of course, using Bing as my search engine, although I could use a different search engine if I wanted to. So basically, here's the use case that I want to uh, use big data for. I want to correlate my web server traffic, which means the, the traffic that I'm getting from my web servers, and correlate that with the sales that I've generated through my e-commerce portal. Let's say I am selling products off of my website, and I wanted to correlate how much traffic am I getting through my website versus how much sales am I getting through it. That way, if there's anything that I could use as far as, or modify as far as marketing strategies or website design is concerned, I can make them, but of course, with the insights that I get from my analysis. So these are my web server logs, and I took the liberty of uploading them to my to my. In the, sorry about the background music there. Anyway, so that's uh, that's my web server logs being uploaded, or I've already uh, taken the liberty of uploading the uh, server logs on my Hadoop cluster. So now what I, I'll do is just basically build structure on top of this. So let me put on my my developer hat here and build a structure on top of that. So I'm showing you a SQL-like statement that I could use to create structure on top of this data. Now think about this. Big data platforms or Hadoop platforms, they're, they're basically just files inside a file system or do, uh, distributed file system. I didn't build a table. I didn't build a structure on top of it. I'm just storing files on my file system, similar to how I would store text files or Word documents inside my file system. So basically what I did was just to create a table, and, and similar to how we would access files in a file system, we need something to abstract that. In this case, I will be using Hive and HiveQL to surface that data from my file system so that I have something that I can take advantage of. Now, like I mentioned, I'm building a, an external table called log staging, and this will be stored as a text file in this particular location. This is the exact location where I stored my IIS or my web server logs. So again, pretty uh, uh, common language, something that we're common, pretty much uh, familiar with. And that's the beauty about Hive is the abstraction between accessing building structure on the underlying file system 
can be done using familiar syntax or constructs that we are familiar with uh, transact SQL uh, when you compare that with SQL Server. So basically, I've, I've already done that, and here's what I'll do next. I'll go back to my Hadoop environment and just call the Hive interpreter so that I can now run Hive queries against my IIS or my web server logs. Now, again, imagine that you already have the data, you already have the files stored in your Hadoop file system, and you don't know how to make the most out of the structure. So this is where you can collect the data first and worry about the structure down the road. The important thing here is you already have the data, and the structure, of course, will depend on how long does it take for you to come up with the business logic to create the structure of the schema for it. Let me just uh, open up my uh, Hive query, and let me just uh, run a very simple uh, select statement. My select statement is basically this. Verify, or rather select star from IIS log, which in this case the IIS log table that I've created with this particular structure. And hopefully it's, well, it's taking a while. There we go. So all I need to do is just run this and just to verify that my data is is how I want it to be based on the structure that I've created within my uh, Hadoop talk system. Now once that's done and once I can verify that my query is running, I can use Hive and the Hive query language to extract that, inf uh, that information from my Hadoop cluster into my Excel spreadsheet or an Excel workbook which I can use for my analysis. And again, I'm just using uh, this particular syntax to show you that indeed it will take a while and you might have noticed running a select statement and displaying just five records in your traditional OLTP database doesn't take 36 seconds. The idea behind this is imagine the file system, or in this case Hive, translating the queries and letting my Hadoop file system read through all of the files. Imagine I've got like 200 plus files in here. Opening every single file and displaying the top five. And this is why real-time queries will definitely not benefit from your Hadoop uh, uh, cluster or running real-time Hive queries on your environment. But again, the point that I'm making here is I can run queries that I'm used to, like the select statement over here, to query data against my Hadoop cluster. Now once that's done, I can extract that data into my Excel workbook, which I've already prepared. So it's, an, uh, it's a, a straightforward Excel workbook, but I Somebody already built a power pivot model for me, so all I needed to do is incorporate my big data or my Hadoop data inside my power pivot model. But before I do that, I want to show you one quick thing. I've downloaded the corresponding Hive ODBC drivers for my particular environment. I've got two drivers, one of which is the Microsoft Hive. ODBC driver, which is available from the Microsoft website. You can download it off and install it on your workstation or on the server on which you want to run Hive queries against. And in this particular case, I've downloaded my Cloudera Hive um, ODBC driver. And I've got it all configured um, for my particular environment. So now I could go to my Power Pivot model and I could connect to my Hadoop cluster and extract the records that I need for this particular exercise or for this particular demo. Uh, if because this session is pretty much integrating um, SharePoint with big data, at the end of this presentation or at the end of the demo, I would be extra uploading the workbook into SharePoint. And of course, I need to have the uh, Hive ODBC driver installed in my either application server or my web front-end server in SharePoint. So in this case, I'm going to get data from other sources, and you've probably seen my data model that's already here. I'm going to connect, uh, select 
ODBC and select my ODBC driver, the one that I've shown you earlier. Are there Hive ODBC? Just testing my connectivity to my Hadoop cluster using the Hive ODBC driver. What next? So what this thing would do is Excel would then go to my Hadoop cluster using the Hive ODBC driver, connect to it, and execute Hive queries against my data source. So I could either select a list of tables, which I've, I've already built the Hive tables inside my Hadoop cluster. So now this wizard is, is connecting there, and it's going to list a lot of, or I only have two at the moment, will list those Hive tables. I'm concerned about the IIS log, and I could do that. I can preview and filter if I want to. Not a good idea though, especially if you're dealing with large amount of data, because this is going to, even though it's just showing you a subset of the data, it's going to extract that data, connect to the Hadoop cluster. And just like what I've explained earlier, Hadoop will translate the Hive queries, and then it will read through all of the files, eventually displaying a subset of all of the uh, files that form the table that I just selected. And it's going to take a while. Or, if you don't want to do this, you could always, well, write your own Hive QL queries, similar to what I've, I've done earlier. So this is how my Hive, uh, Hive table looks like, which is exactly the same content as what I've shown you based on the web server log that we looked at. So that's one option. Another option is to write a query similar to what I did, I've done earlier, is just to um, copy uh, copy this query. But I'm not going to do this because it again, it will query my data in my Hadoop cluster, and that's going to take a while. So what I've done is I've taken the liberty of pre-populating my Excel spreadsheet or my workbook with data instead of me waiting to get that thing loaded. So I have another worksheet that already has the data in my cluster uh, for my cluster inside a worksheet. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to correlate the data that I've got from my Hadoop cluster into my existing Power Pivot data model. And while that's going, let me just shut down my uh, VM and fire up my uh, my other VM. So going back to my power pivot model and show you the new power pivot model that now incorporates data from my Hadoop cluster. My power pivot model. And so one of the uh, tabs that you see here is called page hits. This was the table that I got from my Hadoop cluster. Now, Hadoop does not have the same data types that you have from your existing uh, old TP data sources. So what we could do in this case is we could change data type first to date. And then we could uh, correlate this with the date table that we have here. So somebody already built the data model for me. All I need to do now is incorporate my data model with the table that I just imported. I'll switch to diagram view at the moment and create the relationships between the two. And once the relationship has been built, I can now create a visualization based on this. So I'm, I will correlate log date with date. And just save this. Now my data model is of course, I don't pretend to be an expert in building data models, but I just took the liberty of, of grabbing someone else's data model and incorporate my uh, big data data table inside a Power Pivot model. Save that. So now, as I mentioned, my data model is created. I can now create a Power View report based on that Power Pivot workbook. And of course, the Power Pivot workbook has 
the data that came from my Hadoop cluster. As I was mentioning, we'll make sense of the uh, use case that we were working on for this particular example. We will correlate the traffic that we were getting from, from our web servers and correlate that with the sales that we were making based on selling items off of our e-commerce site. Close this and say use internet sales. Now close this real quick. I'll select the date table. Yeah, hopefully I can select that. Date table. I'll select say I want to analyze a month at the moment and correlate that with page hits. So what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to correlate the number of hits per month and correlating that with the uh, sales that I'm making for that particular month as well and, and creating a, a, a visualization based on that. So I've got hits and order quantity. Of course, it's a pretty bare table, so what I'll do is I'll create a line based on this. And you can see where this is going, where I can create fancy visualization reports using Power View from within an Excel spreadsheet. So this is, uh, this is how my graph looks like. And of course, uh, these are now slicers and dicers from within my Power View. I can go ahead and add more into this visualization just to make it a little bit more fancy. I can create a quick another one. I'll uh, say day. I'll select day in my uh, date table and hits. And I can make this a different chart as well. Say uh, fact, and there we go. Nice and fancy report I could easily create using Power View. And let me add one more. I'll uh, add hmm, the, let's see. Calendar quarter. Uh, calendar date and calendar quarter for this case. Let's say and um, page hits and order quantity and say column chart cluster column. And as I was mentioning, these items now become slicers and dicers as well. So I click on this and see how my reports, my my uh, visualization become dynamic. I can click on order quantity and this will only display the order quantity for that particular uh, graph. And there we go. Now you could save this and either send it off to people who may benefit by looking at this graph and do analysis and visualization. Or what we could do is we can upload it in SharePoint. I mean, most people don't like the fact that SharePoint, they think, is just a glorified file share. But think about this. If you create a, a visualization based on a Power View, you created your Power Pivot models, created visualization by Power View, imagine how it would look like if you start sending out that Power View report or that Excel workbook to 50 people or 100 people, plus you need to track how many people are looking at that report, plus how do you worry about versioning? Who gets to keep the original version? So with SharePoint 2013, you can now integrate that and have a unified way, a unified version of looking at the different reports and views. So this is what I'm going to do next. What I'm going to do is just going to take that report and upload it within SharePoint. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to log in into my... Uh, Windows workstation and just upload that report. I already built that report and I am going to 
upload that report within SharePoint, and then from there, even within the site collection, I can create an alert that says every member of this particular site collection will get alerted when I uh, post this particular report from within SharePoint. And then you can change that report anytime you want, and everybody, everyone who has access to that report will have a unified view of the data. If you change anything on that Power Pivot data model, they all get to see the same thing. Instead of you having to track where's the original version of the workbook, how do I get access to the person? IT can now manage that environment using SharePoint. Now, I've, I'm, I'm pretty sure most of you have had that cases where a small project like an access database ended up becoming a mission critical application. Same thing with the um, same thing with uh, oops with the uh, most applications. Let me just be twenty thirteen. Oops. And it's the same thing with the most applications where it starts out as a small project and eventually ends up being a mission critical one. So just tracking how how that application translates to our life cycle is something that IT professionals are also keen on evaluating. So let's uh, take a look at uh, uploading that report in SharePoint and hopefully I don't hopefully I can change this in process. Uh, my okay. Uh, cancel. My IE is not responding. While waiting for this, I hope you are getting something out of this presentation. And as I mentioned, the only thing I need to do right now is upload that report into SharePoint. And once that is done, the same experience that you were seeing while I was clicking and dragging and uh, modifying the report, you get. And IE is still misbehaving. Uh, let me do one thing. There we go. Ah. Come on. HTTP, this the 2013 documents. Ah. Guess my uh, internet connection is blocking. Uh, let me just disable my uh, disable. There we go. Go back and upload the same report. Close. Anyway, just uh, to summarize that, again, the only thing that I need to do at this point is just upload that into SharePoint. And anybody who has access to the SharePoint environment will have access to the report. And same look and feel, except that instead of having it in Excel, you have it in browser. And hopefully I could uh, switch back and uh, activate that from within my, uh, my environment. Close. Perfect. Libraries. And I'm going to upload that in my, oops, my uh, document library. Uh, document. There we go. And make sure that I have that document in here. All I need to do right now is drag and drop that over here. And so I mentioned it's the same uh, experience, user experience, as you would see, uh, but now within my browser instead of having Excel. And again, the beauty of this is users don't have to have Excel 2013 installed in their workstation as long as they have access to a machine with a browser all works well. So now it's rendering the report. 
And just to give you uh, uh, an overview of how my environment looks like, I have a web front end server, an application server, and a database server, plus in this case a Windows 7 workstation, a typical environment that a lot of uh, users have when they access SharePoint that basically uh, uh, has my application server running reporting services, analysis services in Power Pivot uh, integrated mode. Then you would see that now this is rendering my report inside my browser. I'll go back to this and switch back to my slide. So I've done the big data analysis with Excel. You've seen how I've incorporated big data inside my Power Pivot workbook, how I've made visualization or created visualization and report based on that Power Pivot uh, model. You've seen me just uploading that Excel workbook within SharePoint 2013. Now it's actually rendering that. And I'm opening up the floor for question and answer. Now, hopefully my report is done by, there we go. Oops, I just made a mistake of uh, refreshing that. There we are. So now we have, again, as I mentioned, same look and feel. You could uh, use these as the bar charts as your slicers. And no need for me to have Excel running on this workstation, although I do have Excel. But it makes it easy for users to access the same workbook from within SharePoint using browser experience. And again, as I mentioned, I'm opening up the floor for questions and answers. Great, thank you very much Edwin. It was really, really interesting. Um, let's see if we got any questions. Not yet.